his heartwarming melodies have made him a flutist superstar around the world. The magic flute of Mo Kaufman. Here's the hunting love theme from The Rose. Mo weaves his magic on timeless classics like Shenandoah, Stranger on the Shore, and this million seller, Swinging Shepherd Blues. The magic flute of Mo Kaufman, a cherished collection of beautiful music. From Polytel, in stores now. Good morning. It seems that there's about one million cans of highly suspect Starkist tuna on the shelves of stores all across this country. And John Fraser, the Minister of Fisheries, has been accused of okaying it for distribution, despite the fact that fisheries department people have said it is rancid and unfit for human consumption. Starkist it is. But Fraser is in the eye of the storm this morning, and we hope to find out from John Fraser what he's going to do about the allegations and about the million cans of Starkist, ocean-made and by-the-sea tuna, including the allegations that he was leaned on by Richard Hatfield and others, causing him to reject the advice of his officials and okay this fish in cans to be distributed. That's one, should be fairly short, short segment of this morning's program. Now, we've got three politicians, I hate to tell you, in the studio this morning who are making their final sweep across the country as part of the somewhat important committee, I kid you not, Special Committee of the House of Commons on Equality Rights, on how to live and love within the Charter. Now, these three are Patrick Boyer. He's a Tory, chairman of the committee from Etobicoke. Sheila Feinstone, the Liberal, she replaced Trudeau uh, in Mount Royal in the House of Commons. And, of course, Sven Robinson, the NDP man who is still MP for Burnaby. And we may have time to compliment Mr. Robinson on the fact that he has finally decided not to obstruct any longer the proper amendment to the criminal code to enable the police of Vancouver to clear the streets of hookers of all sexes. And then, towards the end of the program, guess who's coming in for a cup of coffee? This morning, Edgar Kaiser, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Bank of British Columbia. And hopefully he can help us to understand what happened to that $1.3 billion of our money funneled into the CBC, which vanished again later as depositors, including overseas investors, cleaned out our taxpayers' money to keep themselves happy. But first off the top, it looks at the moment like the special committee members on equality rights. After me. The special parliamentary committee on equality rights is meeting today all day at the Hyatt Regency at half past ten. If you want to go and hammer your concern about discrimination under Section 15 of the Charter, which is to guarantee equality under the Charter. Right, panel? Mm -hmm. Legal the, equality. Legal equality. In yep. the panel this morning, we have Sheila Feinstone. You took Trudeau's, Trudeau's place, didn't you? I took the seat in Mount Royal. You're perfectly right. You look much more pleasant and charming than Trudeau looks, I'll tell you. I think But are you as bright? I would not uh, allow that to be mixed up. Okay. Patrick Boyer from Etobicoke or Etobicoke? Etobicoke, Lakeshore. Lakeshore, chairman of the committee. Correct. And what's your name again, sir? What's yours, Jack? Webster, what's yours? Robinson. Sven. Sven. You're looking better this morning with your glassy John. Nice to be back, Jack. Now, please tell me, Patrick Boyer, what are the great concerns of equality which have been thrust at you by people across the country? I can think of mandatory retirement, income tax injustices for common law people, facilities for uh, handicapped and mentally uh, 
underprivileged, if that's the right word. What are the things that stick from your hearings across the country? What's worrying Canadians? Well, let's, let's even take that first one that you mentioned, mandatory retirement. We uh, now have a charter that says it's, it's unlawful to discriminate on the basis of age. And yet we have laws in this country that say when you reach age 65, you have to retire. Uh, we think that you can probably make a pretty strong constitutional argument that uh, those laws uh, cannot stand under Section 15. But here's why our committee... So we need to say if, if that wins, we're yeah. going to have 90-year-old judges doddering about on the bench? We may even have 90-year-old uh, hosts of TV programs. Wrong, sir. We are in the cold bite of public competition. If we can't perform, we get fired. I we think, have no Jack, protection. Come on, Jack. You have to recognize that, uh, let's just talk about ordinary people. Talk or about pensions. Talk about mandatory retirement. Right. All right. What we are saying is that there has to be uh, an understanding that to discriminate just because you are 65 is not fair, uh, that it's not right, and that we have to have the kind of laws that are going to reflect my competence and your competence. Do you think you're going to lose your marbles because you're going to be hit 65, some magic age? I don't think so, Jack. No, so, I'm totally in favor of that. I'm just concerned, however, about uh, union contracts, Sven, labor right. contracts, the promotion of younger people who are waiting for these doddering old oh, people well, like myself to get out of the way. Uh, Jack, I think there is an, another important point, and that is that uh, we're not talking about just eliminating mandatory retirement per se. We've also got to be looking very seriously at lowering the age of voluntary retirement because there are people that uh, would be quite happy to get out at an earlier age. Take a coal miner who's been working all his life underground. Uh, let him get out at 55 on a decent pension. Uh, right. There are others that, uh, that would be quite pleased to get out at an earlier age, and I think we want to look at, at the choice. The fact is now that there are people who are capable, who are qualified, who want to be able to continue working, and suddenly at 65 they're told to get out, and that can't be right. We're really ar arguing motherhood, though, are we not, Patrick? Uh, there are many people who have given the proper funding of a pension. We have a big crisis in British Columbia just now, where men with 40 years seniority are, old, are bumping men in the IWA who have 18 years seniority, <laughs> and they can't get out because they can't get pensions. Is there any way in the state of this country we can improve that in the years, in the immediate years to come? Well, that's uh, when you get to the pensions, I think you're right on to the, the nub of the that's thing. Right. Because if you say that we can have a flexible retirement age, the, then the next issue is how does that affect uh, pensions? That right at the moment, the Canada Pension Plan, as you well know, as, uh, as the viewers know, is, is uh, geared to come in at age 65. And then the private pension plans have been put in place to dovetail with that. And that's why it's important that a, a committee like ours is reviewing this so that we come in with a, a comprehensive package. Because you, you cannot just change something that affects retirement age without looking at the pension well, background to it. The three of us being reasonable people could write the report on that issue right now, couldn't we? Perfectly well, simple. One, of the, uh, one of the biggest concerns that's come before the committee, though, is, is the concern of elderly women and the fact that the pension schemes in this country and the mortality tables that are used for pensions discriminate against older women. And uh, two-thirds of the women in the country that are over 65 are poor. And one of the reasons for that is un fair and unequal pension plans. So I those can are the understand kind of that, but at. the point I'm making is what Canadian would disagree with the proposition that there should be no mandatory retirement on the basis of age only, and that there should be opportunity to leave earlier with a satisfactorily funded pension, and that it should be equal between men and women. Why hasn't that been done? Well, you're the body, you're Why the politician, well, Jack, not me. I think what I started to say... But that's the basic principle, Absolutely, and the government should have and could have made that decision. It's one of the things that we're concerned about. And uh, we are not anxious that the courts make decisions, which will happen in this instance because it is outside the law. We are saying, let's take our responsibilities and legislate in the comprehensive way that is necessary because just to legislate that age is not the factor will throw everything out of kilter, and you have to look at this whole uh, package and look at the discrimination that's Absolutely. inherent. And of course, you two both come from Ontario, don't you? Ontario oh, and pardon Quebec. me, Quebec. You have no the idea. East. The East. Uh, what's your percentage of unemployed in, in Ontario? In, in Ontario, well, I guess it's it's close to the, the national average. No. In my in my in my in my riding, it's uh, it's about uh, five and a half percent unemployed. You know what it is here? Mm. 14.3. Mm -hmm. And we were so in, you live we were in, in a different John's. world, don't you? I live in Canada. Yeah, but you're a different so, uh, economic world. 
I live in Canada, and so if there's unemployment well, I think at, that if you look at any level across this country. That, that concerns me. We just sometimes think that you, you people in the East don't really realize it. I'm I'm not an Easterner. I'm a Canadian. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I think that uh, I don't like being been wrapped been. in Western flags or Eastern flags, and I would like to support what Patrick just said. Well, Jack. we're looking for some action from our government. We don't expect much because what can you do except prime the pump? But weren't we promised, uh, Jack, something about jobs, jobs, jobs? Mm -hmm. That's good. That right. Well, that's not fair to no. turn it into that. Okay. Next issue you want to raise about equal rights, please. Well, I think the uh, question of mentally and physically handicapped Canadians is a fundamental one that we've going to, we've got to deal with. We've heard from a lot of organizations across the country, and what it comes down to really is a matter of attitude, much more than a matter of dollars. Uh, there are so many things that can be done that are, are simple. I look at Michael Wilson in, in the budget on May 23rd. At the stroke of a pen was able to increase the, uh, the deductions that uh, about 85,000 people in this country can make uh, under the Tax Act because of uh, the expense they have uh, medical expenses. Fair enough, but what about disabled. the broad picture? What, what, what can you really achieve apart from common sense, decency, consideration and attitude? Well, then, it's all money, isn't it? It comes down to money and it comes down to political will. Uh, there was a report that was tabled in the House called the Obstacles Report. It was a unanimous report. All parties supported it. it made a whole series of recommendations for uh, independent living, for access to jobs, for access to transportation. It's all there. The studies have been done. And what we're saying now and what we're hearing from the disabled is that it's time to act. Question on family allowances. Is the discrimination in, under the charter interpreted in the payment of family allowances? Well, there is a concern about that. I don't know if we've looked at that, uh, particularly with respect to discrimination as it go to the women and to the men and by automatic to the women. Uh, it goes to the women automatically I, at the moment. I would like to come back to a comment that was made just before. When you asked what are the major uh, issues, mm. uh, I would like to suggest with respect to the handicapped, that ability rather than disability is where we should focus and that we have been absolutely discriminatory in many ways uh, with respect to their inability to access to the right to earn a living and the right to housing, and that's where we have to do something about it. Are you going to waste your time in this business of combat for women in the armed forces? We're certainly going to be dealing with that because we're starting with the premise time. that uh, equality is now the, the legal requirement in this land and on legal equality and non-discrimination. And unless somebody can give a good reason as to why you, uh, regardless of your sex, your age, your religious background, any other thing, uh, are not capable of, of doing a job where the specifications have been clearly set out, be those uh, job requirements for being a soldier, being a broadcaster, being somebody that works in, in, uh, on the railways or anywhere. If you, if you can meet those job specs, you should get the job. Jack, Denying if you had women heard, a combat role is no, sexist, is that Jack, right? If you had heard, Jack, it's no, 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 Jack if you had denying heard... Denying women a combat role regarded as sexist? Yes. Just is it regarded as sexist? Is it regarded as sexist? You know what if it you is? had heard from, re the, from the ten-year-old girl in Toronto, Jack, ten years old, Joyce Swain, who appeared before our committee, made a very eloquent presentation. She said, look, I want to be a fighter pilot when I grow up. And as it stands now, I'm not allowed to be a fighter pilot. And if I qualify, I should damn well be allowed to do that job. Have you seen the movie The Last Starfighter? I mean, none of us want women or men to ever be in combat. That's a job uh, they could do. Women can push buttons as well as anybody you, else. You know what it is? Today's war is a high-tech war, and it doesn't take a male personality to push a button. You've got to fix the charter so women can become fighter pilots with nuclear weapons. After the break. What are you trying to get me into trouble? Yeah. <laughs> Many members of the public, and I say this with respect, deference, and humility, get awful fed up with you people and all your talk, your airy fairy talk. Tell me, um, what about affirmative action? Should there be a certain proportion of jobs go to women? There should be definitely a certain proportion of jobs that go to women and minorities, and by conscious consideration of the equal qualities of those people. Quotas. Not quotas, targets. Quota target tokenism. It's not tokenism, Jack. You are losing a potential of excellent leadership and excellent I leader. I agree uh, entirely that you talents. can pick the best person from any segment, minority, male, female, or homosexual in the country, and give them the job. But you Which won't you get. Should. 
But you, because of the preponderance of the still the male influence, you want to make it affirmative action by quotas. No, we're saying that there are barriers that exist now and that if there are qualified women uh, to do the job, that they're being shut out and that that's not right and that part of equality is, is that. And you mentioned homosexuals. One of, the, uh, one of the issues that our committee has been dealing with, Jack, is the whole question of uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, the private uh, members bill, which, uh, which I tabled in the House, which has been referred to the committee. Uh, uh, now, my, my view on that is, uh, and speaking personally and as a conservative, I believe in a meritocracy, a, a system where you hire the best person based on merit and you promote the people based on merit. And when that person is hired or promoted or fired, it's because of their ability, not because they're male or female, black or white, Hindu or Christian, uh, homosexual or straight. Uh, those are chips that fall by the side. What is important, I think, for the viewers of the program this morning to realize is that Section 15 of the Charter goes on to say that if a government decides to redress some imbalance that has arisen because of past discrimination and, and push the hiring of women in a certain sector or push uh, some other group that has been left behind, then, 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 then that, that is not unconstitutional. It still is up to the government of a day, federal or in a province, to decide whether it wants to take uh, special programs, what some people call affirmative action, and do that. But uh, you're in favor of a meritocracy with affirmative action for women and minorities and disabled. I believe in a meritocracy. I believe if there are glaring discrepancies that are based on past prejudice, that uh, there may have to be redressing of that, but only for a short term. I think that if you look at the evolution of our society, it is working well. That sounds like a good, sound Tory position, and you wouldn't disagree with that, would you? Well, I think that uh, the reality is, Jack, if you look at the, at, the, at the present approach that's being taken, the voluntary approach, mm -hmm. it hasn't worked. And if you're disabled in this country and you're perfectly qualified, the doors are still closed on you. If you're a woman, the doors are still closed in too many cases, and the pay that you get is far less than that of a man who's doing equivalent work. So those are, that's, that's not equality. Uh, if you, uh, we, we met with, a, a men, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, we met with a, a, a gentleman from the RCMP who had been in the RCMP for 18 years, an outstanding record of service to the RCMP and to his country. He was fired, or sorry, he wasn't fired, he was called in by his inspector and told that because of the fact that he happened to be homosexual, uh, that he was losing his job after 18 years after 18 years and that can't be right no, any more than it's right that the are that the armed right. forces what are the right. rights that you want homosexuals to have under sexual 15 of the canadian charter of rights and freedoms well what we're saying is that there should be equality you all agreed in this you know yes absolutely well, I think, I think jack as I'd a like point of introduction it's important to to realize that, that section 15 says there shall not be any discrimination uh as an open general principle Point two is that uh, Sven Robinson uh, had a bill in Parliament to deal with discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. In fact, Pat Carney, also known locally here, uh, had... Oh, vaguely. How do you spell her name? Carney, yes. You, Carnage. I'll, I'll tell you after. Oh, uh, is uh, someone who, even before Sven, had a private member's bill in the House to do the same kind of thing. That's been referred to our committee, and across Canada we have heard from a lot of uh, groups and individuals who are stating this position that their sexual orientation should not be the basis of discrimination when what it comes to bill accommodation. What does your for specifically? What it specifically asks for is including sexual orientation in the Canadian Human Rights Act so that you can't lose your job on the basis of your sexual orientation, you can't be thrown out of your home on the basis of sexual orientation, you can't be denied services on the basis of sexual orientation, and other federal laws which now discriminate. The right to get married? No, we're not talking about No, that. I'm asking that. Yeah. I've got a note here which says they want protection in the workplace. Fair enough. The right to get married. That's the kind of thing that ordinary people think. Strange, sure. isn't it? Marriage is under provincial legislation, oh. but what we have heard, Jack, is that uh, that those who are involved in long-standing relationships should ha should be treated similar to those who are involved in common law. Oh, you mean that uh, homosexuals living together should get marriage allowances? An no. income tax. No, no, no. What we're saying, Jack, is I'm not that trying to misunderstand. No, 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 no. What we're saying is that... Uh, it goes against a fair amount of, uh, I suppose, uh, lack of understanding of the homosexual problem, no. doesn't it? I think I mean, if you say to me you're going to put in the right for homosexuals to adopt children, many eyebrows will go straight through the roof. Is that provincial or federal? That comes under provincial legislation, but the fact of the matter is that in adoption law, what should be considered is who is the most capable and loving parent for that child, and what's in the best interest of that child. Jack, you might want to invite uh, a group that we heard right here in Vancouver 
on uh, partners of people who have ha who now are homosexuals. People An interesting program. Partners. Yeah, people without partners. They did have partners, and they're no longer partners. Yeah. All right, but they are the wives. They F3 are the wives. Of Columbia since day one. Well, let's see. I don't know if I spelled out a story or not for you this morning. Well, the one thing that's on my mind in terms of equality, it's uh, we've held we've held hearings all across the country. We've heard from more groups in, uh, since May than most parliamentary committees here over the course of three parliaments. But the only thing that's unequal in all of this is that this is our second set of hearings in Vancouver. No right other here. city in Canada has had this kind of unequal treatment. Uh, we've only right been here. once in every other city, so I can't oh. understand it. Maybe you can answer. Why does Vancouver, you know, Toronto used to be called Hogtown, but now here's Vancouver getting two hearings from the Equality Rights Committee. And people seem people seem to be very very interested in the subject here. Oh, did you here. bring your golf clubs with you? Is that no, why you? No, came? I just brought my gavel. To We've keep noticed the me. Easterners. You know, I Jack, that's in this. Have morning. a very f uh, nice preference to come as often as they can at taxpayers' expense to the west coast. Jack, I wanted to just make one other point, which that's is a serious not, point, um, if I may, and that's with respect to the, the role of this committee. What we are saying is that Canadians shouldn't have to go into yeah. the courts to fight for their rights. That costs money. What we want to do is make sure that the laws are changed to reflect equality. I, if I may just add to that, the thing that is key here is that you cannot change society's mentality, but in a sense you can be directive with your legislation and society comes along with it. And this country, through a unanimous act of all levels of government, federal and provincial, said Canada shall be an open, a welcoming society. Do you have any points to raise with these three key members of the Special Parliamentary Committee on Equality Rights, a court living with the Charter? If so, please uh, telephone now after the break. Identify my guests this morning. Sven Robinson, Patrick Bauer, my Boyer, and Sheila Fine gold, fine stone. Any old stone. Together from Mount Royal. Right. Where am I going? My right. Go ahead to the committee, please. Yes, uh, you said services are equal to. Uh, would that also include your uh, workman compensation and your medical files, the privacy of them? That uh, is a, that's a very important question, but unfortunately, it's a matter within provincial jurisdiction, the Workers' Compensation Act. Uh, yeah, we can't touch that one this morning, I'm afraid. Well, there's a point to be made there, Jack. The Section 15 applies throughout Canada. It, federal governments, provincial governments, oh. municipal governments. So that uh, the government of B.C., just as what we're doing at the federal level, should be doing uh, its own And audit that's why we've got uh, of, a, couple of, of a couple of thousand uh, challenges, uh, court problems under the Charter. That's right. Well, Some that's, of them which are quite, on the face of it, quite stupid. Well, well, that's that's in general. That's across the board. But, under but section anything 15, under six, section 15, provincial, municipal, or anything else, can be taken to the courts for the equality to be established under section mm -hmm. 15. Correct. Section 15 is so part of the mm -hmm. supreme law of Canada. Well, you can't directly interfere with it. The man should know that if he's being unfairly dealt with, he can get a lawyer and go under section 15. If he can well, afford he it. Yeah. Well, he may have legal well, aid. Sure. You must oh, have legal. Surely you're going here. to give legal aid to everyone for the charter. We're talking about the importance of having a, a fund that would would uh, provide uh, money to people that are going to be challenging cases under the, oh, yeah. under so the charter. Make a levy on lawyers, wouldn't they, for that? That was what the Attorney General of Ontario, Ian Scott, was uh, proposing down in Halifax. Uh, Do you think that he, he got he got mixed reviews <laughs> for that proposal, Jack? Do you think that short of the socialist Valhalla, which will eventually come, that we shall see legal aid for everyone in this country who wants to challenge the charter? Don't you think that equality under the law means access if you don't have financial means? Of course it does, love. But you're a left-wing liberal. You and I know perfectly well that legal aid doesn't work. Legal aid, legal aid is a cornerstone of the system of justice in this country. Are you happy with the legal aid in British Columbia at the moment? Legal no, aid is it, grossly underfunded is in British Columbia That's at the, the moment. That's the point I make. And across the country too, no doubt. That's right. Not quite so grossly underfunded in wealthy Ontario, though. No, no, that's no, right. You, well, we, that's true. we didn't have the right to deal with that, but I was reading the Canadian Constitution right through, Jack, and in it there is a federal-provincial equalization uh, as a principle within the Constitution. 
and I'm very anxious when we finish with this equality rights to take a look at legal aid. You see, this is why I get a little bit irked at times. We're all talking glibly about legal aid. As practical people and politicians in a way, we know perfectly damn well legal aid is highly unsatisfactory and will stay as such under a conservative government, won't it? Well, one of the problems is a year ago during the election, Jack, we were promised, Canadians were promised, that for important charter challenges by groups such as the disabled, yeah. women's groups and so on, that there would be funding available. And Indian rights. And, and, and Native and rights, but uh, that has not happened and that promise has not yet been kept. We keep waiting well, for, a, for an announcement. The Minister, there is an the announcement minister, coming. The minister of Justice has uh, got, a, got a plan in, in well. shape on that. We're going to be dealing with that in our report, which is going to go to Parliament in four weeks anyway. And, uh, Good. Go ahead, yeah. please. Uh, is that mine? Yes. Right. Uh, you said it, Jack. You're all talking very glibly. What, if anything, does the committee intend to do about man's rights to, to find work? That is, to remove restrictive trade practices by, uh, between trade unions and employers. God bless you. The closed shop. Is the closed shop an invasion of equal rights for Canadians of all stripes, colors, shapes, sizes? That's not dealt with under the provisions of Why the not? rights section, Jack. And, uh, That's the very one we well, want. Yeah. Why not? You're not the, may I suggest you're not the first who's raised the issue of economic rights. Are you going to rights. dodge it? I don't think it's within our mandate, Jack. I would like to see us address it in a general overview, but it is not within our well, mandate. I would go, no, I'd go my, beyond my, that, though, and I would say that, that the issue of the closed shop is not one which should be addressed under the provisions of the Charter of Rights. Why there not? Are, there are a whole like series of complex is. questions which arise there, not the least of which is the question of why should an individual who consciously decides to opt out of a particular trade union get all the benefits which that union bargains for. I don't think Mr. That's right. Robertson, this says uh, here, the letter and spirit of equality and non-discrimination. Why should I be denied, and I'm being the devil's advocate, the right to go work in a union shop or a closed shop because my principal, and I'm a perfectly qualified in every which way, because of an artificial union agreement? Now, is that not being tackled by your committee? I think there's no question that, that a lot of union practices in this country that have developed have got to be reviewed in light of the spirit. Well, I'm of, just talking of, about of closed shops. Union yeah. shops. That's Don't. right. And, uh, you know, if we're reviewing what governments do and if we're reviewing practices, employment and hiring practices of corporations and non-discrimination, I think it's only fair that the, uh, uh, the same brush sweep everywhere and that unions revisit a lot of the uh, arrangements that they've developed over the Have you had years. no challenges, you know, the number of, I was going to say oddballs, but independent spirits that are in B.C., no one's challenging you on the closed shop as a breach of equality then. The only challenge we have heard from an economic perspective of that kind has been from uh, co corporate businesses who think that their right to invest and their right to use risk equity comes before the application of equality, uh, which I didn't find a very acceptable principle, Jack. Come on, tell me if I'm wrong, no. Sven. You're never backwards and tell me if I'm wrong. Don't you think that a closed <laughs> shop denies a free Canadian the right to make a living for which he is perfectly qualified? No, I don't, John. You don't? I don't. I think that the issue is an, an important one, but it's not one, first of all, which comes under the Charter of Rights, Section 15, and I think some very strong arguments can be made that that particular practice is one which uh, has been uh, in effect to ensure that workers who bargain for certain fundamental rights, and freedoms, and pay package. Jack, can uh, I don't say something, write, please? Don't, uh, yes, please, you say something. Yeah. All right, Mr. Robinson and Miss Feinstone, just a few moments ago, you very glib people were telling we, the listeners, how people have rights at age 65 to continue providing they are competent to perform their, 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 their work tasks. Now, I'm suggesting to you that if I'm competent to perform a work task, it should not matter a damn whether I belong to a union or I don't, as long as my employer is prepared to pay me a day's wages for a day's work, what has trade unionism got to do with equality of rights? And it's a very yeah. good question. I don't happen to be on his side, and I want to see unions survive, mm -hmm. but this is where your charter's going to get you into all kinds of trouble. Well, if we allowed that argument to prevail, it would destroy the trade union movement in this oh, country. Oh, but that's not the point. We're dealing with the letter of the charter. Well, I think, though, Jack, I mean, we dealt with the letter of the charter and, and, and had hundred stupid court decisions, didn't we? Well, are you suggesting that the charter should strike down the closed shop? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm, I'm amazed it hasn't been brought out for discussion. An important matter as against the combat role of women in the that, armed forces. That, that same issue... It appears to me that the majority of, of work people in, in Canada are, in fact, non-trade unionists. 
majority are. Well, that's, not, that's not the issue. I mean, they, they, I think that the color has raised a legitimate concern mm -hmm. in terms of sure. economic rights. The right to, 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 a, to a job and the right to full employment in this country is something that, uh, you know, is pretty fundamental. And the right for him to be hired by an employer who considers him the better man for the better... Please forgive me, Sheila. Yeah, I understood person. what you meant, although I, I'm glad you're changing it. The best person. But the same issue comes up in the university context where you have professors <coughs> who have tenure. Uh, it's, it's another variation of the same theme. And uh, uh, people that are holding down those limited number of jobs now and decreasing number of jobs with cutbacks at the university, uh, you have very serious uh, impediments facing new people that are coming in to be professors. Well, in British Columbia, tenure is a thing of the past. Our provincial government at UBC has just uh, proceeded, or the Board of Governors has proceeded to, uh, to completely undermine. Uh, undermine. I'm glad you didn't undermine. say why not. No, we, not why not, because but they, to undermine they that a new principle, tenure you know, contract. Without any consultation Well, I, I personally think that's a good thing. I don't see why professors who are not producers should have tenure as long as they have Do they freedom have some of speech in of today's measure? society. Tenure has been overdone and has become a protection for many academic layabouts. Oh, you the, well original, know that. the original purpose of tenure, Jack, as you know, was to ensure freedom, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. But now that we live in such a secure society protected by the Charter, the Charter will protect our freedom of speech, right. won't it? Another short break with my committee members after the break. Are these all... I did not start broadcasting in Montreal. What an error of judgment on your part. What a great city. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yep. Hi. I mean, um, I've been discriminated against, and I don't really know how to, what to do about it. Um, because I have a slight disability, um, the government paid a lot of money to educate me as a financial aid worker for the government. Mm -hmm. And I went to Langara and took the courses, graduated with a B average, and was told halfway through the course that nobody over 40 had ever been hired by the ministry. Um, even though I went through when I graduated, wasn't able to get a job, um, applied to be hired as a person with a disability with the federal government. They've had me on a waiting list for a year, and um, I keep phoning, and they say, well, we sent your resume, and it's excellent resume. There are four departments that you could possibly work in, in the social work field. And um, I keep getting told, well, they're not hiring. So my question is, how many disabled people are hired by the federal government and the provincial government? Good question. Do they have a quota? There are no quotas, no. Yeah. But certainly there are supposed to be attempts to encourage the hiring of qualified disabled people. Well, I mean, what does this woman do? She may not be the best person for the job. There may be no jobs available. She feels she's discriminated well, she's, against. Yeah. Does she come to you? No, we're, we're, we're not handling specific individual cases, but what she is saying sounds to me like uh, something is, is certainly wrong there. And I think at the moment it's fair to say the federal government has been uh, a good example in this country of an employer who is trying to get people into positions that reflect the diversity of, of what Canada is about. But here's where the rub comes in, Jack and, and Madam, who is on the line. My name's Sheila. Sheila. Good morning. Sheila. Good morning. Got lots of Sheilas. The federal government right now is trying to reduce the size of uh, of the federal civil service. You mean service. the federal government hey, firing Webster, people, laying people off? Yeah. 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 That, I know, it's just double talk. You and see, we you. have 213,000 unemployed in British Columbia right now. We, unlike Ontario, are in a drastic mess. When we hear you people talk about reflecting the diversity, there are no jobs. That should be your first problem. And the first, first people on the plus. firing line are women and young people and people such as this woman who are disabled. See, I'm all getting jobs to talk about it. Yeah. Damn it, you've got a big salary to talk about my problem, but you're not doing anything about it. Well, just, just hold on. I don't think that uh, you want to pass judgment on what we're doing yet until you see what we're going to recommend to Parliament. Listen, I'll be too time. old the time you recommend. Well, I mean, I'm going to be 50. 52 tomorrow. Well, you'll be 52 in four weeks uh, when our report comes out. I mean, I'm not trying to be insensitive to what you're saying. Believe me, if anybody's committed to seeing that there's a, a fair deal, I am. I but, don't believe you. Well, you know, I don't think we that don't they we're going to change everything through our report. Our report is going to be directive to government where we feel we would like to see the changes that relate to discriminate, legal discrimination under the law. This woman has a, an, a 
well-founded complaint and an observation that is one that hurts many people throughout this country and particularly here. She reflects the diversity of desperation in British Absolutely. Columbia when she hears politicians talking, talking, talking talk, about talk. many things I mean, which are not all that a, important. I, lost I, I was in pain when I took those courses. Love I could have just enough. stayed home on welfare, but I, I dragged myself out in winter and rain. I'm God bless you, my Your dear. Can I ask, I as, a, as a local member of Parliament, if Sheila wants to contact my constituency office, I'd be glad to look Excuse into me, the situation. Excuse me, I am an NDP, person. and they haven't helped me either. Well, please you contact can't help office. either, with the best will in the world. You cannot get her that a job is. unless you use drag, influence, pull, and push, and defy somebody else who may be better qualified the job. I can make sure she's been dealt with, at least fairly under Civilly. the existing you can That's call a, what's his name, Robinson, one of the NDP. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack, we're sure getting annoyed with these people they send in here from back east. They come up with these silly programs that uh, these equal rights they're talking about. They're not interested in real equal rights. The, the shops, shop, clothes shops, they're not interested in that. All they want to do is uh, they want me to ask them questions like, uh, how long will we have to hire these professional uh, ladies to play football or hockey? Oh, yeah. Will they get their equal uh, share of the of the professional sports. They're not really interested in anything else. Look, this gentleman referred to the Easterners, and I'm a Westerner, and I think that all three of us are Canadians, as Patrick said. It's not an East-West West issue. I make no apologies for what was said here. This particular province at this moment is going through one of the worst times in its history, and people are concerned about jobs. And when you begin to talk about combat roles for women in the armed forces, one tends to lose patience. It we're, is a waste of we're time. Not Look, just Jack, you, you, that, have, right? you have before you, and I think that that's the thing that must be understood, a law that was accepted by all the provinces and this government. We are not representing East or West, we are representing Canadians. And the long-term view is the hope that with economic turnabout there will be equality and it will not be played out on the back of natives and invisible minorities and women and that equality of access and equality of opportunity along with the responsibilities inherent will come about. Move The only thing that, we, that I understand from what you people are saying every time you come out here is that you got the Western provinces here we are your slaves. You got their tariffs at the border here, so we cannot buy things cheaply. And now you're going to find some way to make sure we don't get free trade with the states, so we can get stuff here at what it costs to get it. Instead, we have to pay black oh, don't forget, people back there. Mr. So Mr. Mulroney is totally, totally and publicly committed against free trade with the United States because it would lose our sovereignty. He said so at leadership convention in 1983, backed by Eddie Goodman. I remember the occasion well. I could probably produce the tape. What? But uh, he may have to adjust in accordance with the committee meetings. We'd love free trade in certain areas, but how much unemployment would it cause in Ontario? You're talking about sectoral freer trade, are you? No, we're talking about free trade. We're not talking about sectoral free trade. They try to bankrupt us here by, with their oil from uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. Well, I, I'm Put glad you get this kind of treatment this morning because it gives you a measure of our fall of discontent in British Columbia. It's, it's, look, it's not just a fall of discontent. I understand, Jack. I come, I represent a constituency in this, in this Places province. Places like Kamloops People are and Tonto angry and they want action. Angry, worried, insecure, fearful. We're worse than Cape Breton. Oh. Ben, when oh, you're really? out there trying to get us to have uh, prostitutes on every corner here, make sure that your daughter has a legal right to be out of prostitution. Oh, yeah, you've got to give it a legal right for prostitution. But I'm not going to go into that with um, Sven this morning. We've been through that before, and his body has propositions to which I strongly and vehemently object. He has, however, and the NDP have decided to pass in amity the sensible amendment to the code which will enable the police to clear the streets of the public pests, with which I'm sure all of us are in agreement. We oppose that bill, Jack. We will continue to oppose the bill, but we are not obstructing it. We're, it should be studied by the committee. We'll have to do a separate one on it, because your views are so way far out, and my views are so old-fashioned that we can't really do a civil program together. We'll do it in the future. We'll do it in the future. My thanks to Sheila Feinstein, and I uh, hope you feel fine today. Thank Patrick you. Boyer and Sven yeah. Robinson. Next, a man of money, Edgar Kaiser. Chief Executive Officer and President of the Bank of British Columbia. Edgar Kaiser is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Bank of British Columbia. And he has certainly made his mark in this province since the days of Kaiser Resources and his transactions with the provincial government. 
Um, two questions off the top. Uh, one is to embarrass you. What's the value of brick stock this morning? With which you're not connected, I hasten to add. I, I don't know is the answer. I just don't follow it. What is the value of the Bank of BC stock this morning? $4.75. What was the issued price of it? Six. Six. That was your new issue when you moved in and took over. You're That's down right. to 475. Yes, That's we are. That's not so good. Well, it's better than uh, than being not an operation. They would have want to do it. Oh, is it a danger of you not being an operation? Not at all, Jack. Were you checked? Was your bank checked by the task uh, committee set up by Barbara McDougall on the state of the banks and trust companies in Canada? Well, we are testifying. Uh, I have to testify next week in Ottawa to the committee on uh, the state of financial institutions, and we'll be doing that. But that's a different thing than being checked. We get routinely checked by the Inspector General of Banks. How healthy is the Bank of BC at the moment? Well, I think it's, uh, it's as healthy as uh, any financial institution is in Canada, and I think most financial institutions in Canada are, are in good shape. Well, one of the first things you did when you came into office, and this was publicly announced, was that you took some $140 million of the bad loans, right? Well, yes, the, the numbers are a little different, but, but the point's right. Hundred and some million dollars. Now, basically what we did, Jack, was to, to say a year ago, look, uh, this bank is not in the kind of condition in which it re it's reporting itself to be. We have a number of bad loans. We sold those bad loans off, and we recapitalized the bank so that today in our equity base, we find ourselves the least leveraged uh, financial institution, in fact, in all of North America of over two billion or more in size. So we're the most conservatively leveraged institution. That means in relation to your assets, you are borrowing much less than you're fully entitled to borrow to lend to other people. Well, actually what it means is if you take your equity base and then you have your loans, which banks call assets, right. all right, that we have fewer number of loans relative to our equity base than other financial institutions of our size or larger. And the reason for that is that we are Canada's Western Bank. And it's no secret to you or anyone else who lives in the West that we've got difficulties out here and these are times to be conservative. The previous management of the bank overextended its loans in Alberta particularly. Am I correct? Well, they, uh, they certainly had a, a higher leverage than I was uh, comfortable with. All right, and you refinanced them by selling them off at a discount, backing the guy who bought them, and is that deal working satisfactorily for the bank's uh, arrangements? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. In fact, uh, one of the things that I think is important to, to note this morning is that while, while there is no question the, the severity of the economic downturn in British Columbia and Alberta, there is equally no question that there is a positive sign occurring. I'm one of those who happens to think that the system is better today than it was 10 months ago. There was a 40-point drop in the stock market in Toronto yesterday, less than the TSC. Uh, do you feel confident at all about the, the market future for financial institutions in, in Canada today? Well, I, I guess I have to say, of course I do. Uh, it, let's start with, with just the, the Bank of Canada, the country's central bank. Uh, that bank, uh, over the years, has been a, one of the most highly regarded central banks in the world. Uh, young men, bright financiers from a number of countries around the world, including the United States, come to train in the Bank of Canada because we had such a highly regarded central bank. Now, if you can make the assumption that this country is fundamentally a sound country with good people and, and good resources, which I do and I know you do, then by definition, the country is going to be all right. That is different than saying that we don't have difficulties just as other nations do today. But when I look at the Northland Bank um, crisis and the comic opera of the CCB, I've got to make a leap of faith to accept your interpretation of the conduct of the Bank of Canada in recent months. Is that overly cynical? I don't think so. No, I don't think it's overly cynical, but I, I also don't think it's a leap of faith. What you have to do based on what has been reported and the way everybody's been conducting themselves is just take a look at the fundamentals of our country. And Sarah, those fundamentals sound, and the answer is yes, they are. 
But if you take a look at uh, the difficulties which CCB and uh, Northland Bank have had, it constitutes less than 1% of our total financial system. And the facts are uh, that the country is running in spite of all that, and it's running in spite of all the political debate that goes on. But the fact remains that if you look at the CCB in some little detail, we would wonder why the Canadian taxpayer has to bail out $121 million in foreign depositors who are getting a fancy interest rate from the CCB. And when their gamble fails, I pay the losses. That's true. And uh, so you do. I'm correct on that. You I'm are. Right. Great, because it gives us a chance to analyze this properly. Here's the CCB in bad financial trouble, right? Posted a loss in some time. And your genius, Bowie, said, if every depositor has left the bank in the next few months, talking about the CCB, we will replace these deposits. He poured in $1.3 billion of my money into a bank which was on the rocks and which was taken away by people who shouldn't have been guaranteed coverage. Let's take that in steps. First right. of all, he's not my genius, Governor Bowie. He's our genius. He is, he is our governor <laughs> of the central bank. my genius, this week, but he's the governor of our central bank. That's right. 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 And I think it's important as Canadians that we all remember that first. Right. Uh, that it is terribly important that we have in world monetary uh, circles a highly regarded central bank and a highly regarded governor of that we central agree bank. That, yes. uh, that we as a nation borrow from a number of other nations and financial institutions in other countries, both nations and institutions. We also, while we borrow from them, they also uh, put money in our institutions. So, and the ba total balance, and you're saying in the case of this institution, the central bank and the leaders of the large financial institutions in this country decided, rightly or wrongly, that they could make this in in institution go. Now, for sure, uh, that can be done and witness the case of Continental Illinois, a bank in the United States which failed one of the largest institutions in that country, larger than most of all of our big financial institutions. In that case, the Central Bank of the United States and the big financial institutions there decided that Continental Illinois should not fail in the, in the interests of the nation, and everybody stayed together, they backed up that bank, and it is returning to profitability. This case differs from that, in that the, the group uh, which had agreed to back the Canadian Commercial Bank split apart after that agreement was made. As a result, your taxpayers' money certainly continued, and mine, continued to go into that institution while private institutions withdrew their funds. They did not stay with their funding lines committed to that institution. Fascinating. What you're telling me is that when we went in, we, when the banks, the federal government, the provincial governments, and the six big banks threw in that 255 million, that was to staunch the flow of blood, right? Yes. And then after that, there was a disagreement. And while the Bank of Canada was pouring in 1.3 billion, the big depositors were taking the money out. That's so. That's absolutely right. So we, the taxpayers, threw in $1.3 billion, some of it to meet the small depositor, mm -hmm. but much of it to meet big depositors. Yes, on the other hand, if everybody had stayed together and the institution worked its way back to viability, that money would not have been lost, would it? What we don't know yet, perhaps you do know, is, is how that came about, how that agreement broke up how much the big depositors took out when we, the people, thought we were saving little people with deposits of up to 60,000. Well, I don't know what went on because, uh, because we're a Western bank and I'm not a member of the Toronto Club. Yeah. So I don't know what went on. All but I know is what you know and we read that in the press. Yeah. Certain, of, certain heads of financial institutions in the country, the moment the deal was made, started talking badly about the deal. So it was a self-fulfilling prophecy that it didn't work. Now, I made the point, too, that there was at least $121 million in foreign deposits, which we, the taxpayers, put in so these foreign depositors could get the money. Mm -hmm. I would say, let them suffer, but you would say that would be bad. I'm saying it's more complicated than that, because uh, foreign depositors in our institutions help our institutions finance Canadian projects. Now, this is the case where the foreign depositors pulled their money out, and it didn't work out quid quo pro quo, 
Uh, but, but it's too simple to say that they shouldn't have done that if our own financial institutions were pulling their money out. What would you do if you were running a financial institution based in other part, some other part of the world? And I saw the Bank of Canada pulling in money into the deposit side of the bank. I'd cash my checks at once. Particularly if you saw Canadian institutions not supporting the Bank of Canada's effort. Particularly you would. Well, this is not good for the image of the big banks, is it? I think it's not, I think that's so, but I think more importantly it's not good as the, for the image of us as Canada. I mean, we have to decide to stick together here. We, we have our own self-interest first, uh, and, and there are a number of ways we can see that. It's, it's like the economy in British Columbia. Uh, one option is to say things are terrible, to feel sorry for ourselves, and, uh, and do nothing about it. The other option is to recognize realistically that things are not good and say we better do something about it and get off our fannies and go to work. More with Edgar Kaiser after the break. Just again, I want to go over this once again with Edgar Kaiser, uh, CEO and chairman, president. Chairman. Still doing your own commercials? Yes. Mm, they're not very good. Frankly. Would you like to do those? No, no. I, I don't <laughs> want to be associated with a bank. I'm Wait a, I'm, a minute. I'm a man of credibility. You're a shareholder of our bank. <laughs> yeah, it's a very small shareholder of your <laughs> bank. Okay, how is the state of the bank right now? Just give me a sharp, sharp, succinct answer. Is there any danger of the Bank of BC getting into any kind of mess like CCB and Northland? No, because we uh, faced the problem early and we stepped up to it, admitted that we had troubles. Our shareholders were terrific in supporting us. We wrote down the value of the stock, wrote down the value of our loan portfolio, and then recapitalized the bank to take advantage of that. Now you just... Well, one of the things that says that, for example, here you've had all this silly press about CCB and Northland that we've been talking about, right. all that confusion, and our retail deposit base is up. Western Canadians, you know, people aren't stupid. They, they know when things are all right and they're supporting the West, and of course our bank is here to do just that. Now, uh, as a man who you yourself bought a million shares at six dollars a share, didn't you? Actually more than that, but yes. But I mean, that was your public announcement at the time, a yep. million shares. Yep. Six dollars a share, so that's done. On paper, you've lost uh, a million and a quarter in stock value yourself. That's right. But as long as you don't sell it, you've got no loss. Uh, that's correct, and uh, you mentioned uh, yesterday's fall in the, in the Toronto stock market. I mean, markets move hither and, and yon, and they tend to react, overreact, one way or the other. Now, generally speaking, what happens is when you get an overreaction, in this case on the negative side, we'll get an overreaction on the positive side, and the value will go to goodness knows what, but it won't be worth that much. I mean, markets are crazy, and we both know it. So the stock will float around depending upon what some analysts said. The only kind of... Uh bad publicity you've had was when you were prepared to lend a hell of a lot of money to T. Boone Pickens from Texas who were trying to take over the Unocal Corporation, the parent company of Union Oil of California, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. Are we still in that green mail play? Uh, the answer is no. We've uh, taken our, our profit, uh, the green mail as you say, it wasn't green mail, but at any rate that takeover bid didn't go through. We never had to put up any money, and we received sizable fees for having participated in the transaction, as did some other 130 other financial institutions. Now, any time our institution can, uh, without risking its base, make money in the United States or any other country in the world and put that money back to work in Western Canada where we need more work, we're going to do that. In this case, uh, this was a credit in which we knew both sides of the transaction intimately. Uh, it was an industry we were familiar with, and we, we knew what we were doing. And were you not criticized at that time, though, for apparently pledging too much of your banks? Would it be assets or equity? Well, you said it perfectly. It was for apparently uh, pledging too much. In fact, we did not. But you know what that's like. The retraction, the correction, always runs on the fifth page as to what you actually did. And as it turns out, the first uh, story which occurred was not an accurate run as to the amount of the participation that our bank had in that loan. Uh, the facts did come out, uh, but they came out on the third page as to actually how much we'd done. 
You went for what, 100 million? 70 million. 70 million dollars, I could. Now, what about your takeover, your very aggressive takeover of that institution on the prairies which got into trouble and while you didn't take over any of the liabilities, you moved in and took over their offices and opened up branches. Uh, that's true. What would you like to know? What's the name of it? Well, it was called Pioneer Trust. It's now called the Bank of British Columbia, Canada's Western Bank. How many branches did you take over and open on that basis? Nine. Where? Uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta. Are they still working? You bet they are. The nine are still open? You bet they are. Are you doing business? You bet we are. And those people that we employed are still all employed. And you didn't take over any of the liabilities of that institution? Well, actually, we did take over the liabilities, but in banking, the liabilities of the deposits. Which were insured? Uh, well, some of them were insured, and then they received, uh, if you had over $60,000 invested in that institution, the difference was made up by the, by the various governments, so that everybody got their money back. But what's interesting about that is that uh, over 85% of those accounts stayed with us. They stayed uh, in those branches with the people they knew, uh, the customers of those branches liked the people they dealt with, and they stayed with Canada's Western Bank. And it's going to be a profitable operation, hopefully. What do you mean, hopefully? You bet. I mean, you're making money on these operations now. We're making money on more than 50% of them. Good. Now, when I put money in your bank or anybody else's bank, I'm covered for $60,000 deposit insurance, correct? Yes. Uh, why should not every nickel of mine in a deposit be covered by some CDIC or by some self-insurance scheme of the big banks? Or should it be covered? Should every nickel I have in the bank on deposit, which the banks use for leverage to loan more money, mm -hmm. should that not be covered 100% by you or any other banker? Money on deposit. Well. You have to take that in two parts because there are really two statements in, in your question. Uh, in, in the first part, uh, if, you, if you say, should it not be covered by us, uh, it is guaranteed by us, but your argument doesn't work if we aren't there anymore. Right. In other words, if we go out of business, of course, it's not covered by us. Right. Um, now, what the federal government has done in this case and done in other nations is they said, look, there should be some security that you have anyway that you're covered. And in the case of Canada, that number has been picked at $60,000. It was 20 until a year ago. Exactly. Some people say it should be more. Some people what should do you say, say it should be less. I don't know what I think yet about the amount that it should be. And one of the reasons that you don't get a good answer from me on that question is that, that we have a smaller institution. I mean, when I joined our bank, we only had 49 branches. Now we have 60 in Western Canada and that number will continue to expand as we continue to expand our services to Western Canadians. But that's not a demographic of the nation, and it's a national insurance policy. And so I don't have, when I testify in front of the committee uh, next week, for example, in Ottawa, I don't have an answer to that because I don't have national figures available as to what number is reasonable. Clearly, some degree of insurance is reasonable. But the greatest insurance policy that any of us have in life is, is to know the people we're dealing with and to know that they're straight. I'd like to take some questions on banking. I don't know if we'll raise much in the way of a storm, but you never know who's out there waiting to get at you. <laughs> Edgar Kaiser, of the Bank of BC, after the break. <laughs> Well, now, uh, you will slap me in the teeth for this, but if I still don't have confidence in the banking system and I've got $120,000, I'm sure as hell I'm not going to put it in one deposit. I'll put it in two deposits, and then I'll be insured on both, won't I? Uh, that's correct. That's absolutely correct, unless you believe that the institution that you bank with is doing something for you, doing something for the community that you live in, and if you believe that it's secure. But when you think of the possibility that here are the big banks in Canada doing in CCB when Bank of Canada is supporting it, uh, am I supposed to have faith in them? Am I supposed to have faith in the banks that created the dome loans? Yeah, I think, I think the answer is yes, you are, Jack, because what's your option? <laughs> what's your option? In other words, if you have... 
If you just listen to the political debate, yeah. you could get very nervous. Yeah. Fortunately, you've got common sense. Faith in the country. I agree with you entirely. I mean, for instance, despite all the fringe problems with Expo, I'm with it 100% because it's got to go. Yeah, not only that, it's not just Jimmy Patterson's Expo. It's not just the Board of Directors Expo. And by the way, it's not just Vancouver's Expo. It's, it's Canada's oh, Expo. You bet it is. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, I'm calling you about the story on CTV News this morning. There's a possibility some $300 million was sent down by the Commercial Bank to a California branch prior to going to the federal government for a bailout. If this turns out to be true, can the directors of the bank be held accountable? The well, Canadian, the, I don't know. I haven't read the well, story I'll just and read I don't it. know the answer. I'm just, we don't have to answer, but just let's read it. Charged in the House of Commons yesterday, CCB transferred up to $300 million in good loans to an ailing U.S. subsidiary before it received its 255 million bailout. That's the kind of thing which we must get from the committee, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's a pretty uh, technical legal question as to, as to where, uh, where that comes out. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, if they knew, in other words, they'll have to prove that they knew that they were giving uh, fraudulent preference to the U.S. subsidiary and actually taking something away from Canada. If they can't prove that, then it stays in the United States. What if they can prove it? Well, well, obviously, you could probably get it back. But however, we don't know enough about it to condemn or praise anybody on the thing. But I'm glad you drew attention to the story. And I think it's essential that this uh, bank committee hearings be covered by television so that we can see what's going on in the place at least some of the time. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your call. People are interested. You know. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. Uh, I would like you to ask uh, Mr. Kaiser how much uh, real estate is being held back by uh, mortgage insurance companies like uh, CMHC that are artificially keeping the price of real estate high in the greater Vancouver area. I have a feeling that it's uh, quite sizable and the real value of real estate would be maybe 15, 20 percent less than what it already is. It's a good question, and I really don't know the answer to it, and I'm not sure if you can find out the answer to it. The one thing, uh, without regard to whether or not it's artificially being kept high, the one thing that's clear to us as an institution in our branch network, not only in uh, the greater Vancouver area, but throughout British Columbia, is that, uh, that real estate is beginning to move. Our, our, our mortgage portfolio is up, and it's up throughout our branch system. Now, whether or not those values are artificially established, I don't know the answer to that. But He's what I do know is there's movement. This caller is suggesting that, uh, that CMHC may be holding back properties which could be thrown on the market, which are a dead loss mortgage wife for which there's no recovery, thereby preventing the true state of the market becoming visible. I've had that proposition put before. Hmm. That's right, Jack. I'm a mortgage broker that uh, spent eight years in Ontario, and that's what uh, the government, the politicians you had in there before, uh, encouraged the financial institutions to do because they have a big base to uh, draw on in the credit markets. Good point, caller, but obviously we can't prove it, but people should be aware of that particular Machiavellian device sometimes used. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Kaiser uh, a bit about the brick situation. Uh, now, first he comes on the, on the program and he states that he knows nothing about the stock price, which is, I think, is baloney because uh, Bank of BC stock is listed almost in the same position on the uh, on the statistics as the uh, as the brick stock. Well, what is it? Two and a quarter? Something in that area. But beyond that, what I'm getting at is. Why do we have to always have these guys like Kaiser coming into BC and they're, uh, they're skinning us, they skin us on the brick deal. Now he's the president of the Bank of BC. Why can't we have our own people? That, uh, well, I think I should answer that question. One, he made a deal with the government of British Columbia which was very satisfactorily financially for Kaiser Resources and your associates. For, for, their, for the shareholders. For the shareholders of Kaiser Resources. Very right. satisfactory. And that uh, you, in fact, moved into the Bank of BC and refinanced it, did you not? Well, a number of Canadians did, yes. But you and your associates refinanced it, and you've got it going again, so no matter if you don't like them, you've got to compliment them and pulling the Bank of BC back into business and giving it renewed confidence, which it needed badly at the time. Now, do not take that as a public relations endorsement. It's an attempt <laughs> to accurately reflect what you have done. 
Well, I think in, I think the, in answer to, the, to the, the, the caller's questions, there are two points. First of all, in not knowing what the BRIC stock is worth, uh, I receive our stock quotes and the other bank stock quotes in the morning on a sheet of paper on my desk. So I don't look at the newspaper to get the stock quotes. That, that answers why I don't know what BRIC stock's doing. Secondly, if you're running any organization, you must work on behalf of your shareholders. In, in my case of running Kaiser Resources, which was a public company, uh, I ran that for the benefit of those shareholders. In the case of the Bank of British Columbia, which a year ago had 2,000 shareholders and now has 14,000 shareholders, the management of the bank is doing the best job it can to run the bank for the benefit of those shareholders and the depositors in our bank. Thank you. After the break. Don't often talk to bankers. Edgar Kaiser, Bank of British Columbia. Go ahead, please. Oh, by the way, whatever, whatever became of Lord Green? <laughs> <laughs> Don't answer that question. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. I was wondering about the uh, um, the protectionist movement in the states or the uh, free trade movement. What has that made in policy changes within the Bank of BC as far as protecting its company investors and things? Well, I mean, anybody in the West, I think, and almost all of us are in favor of free trade. No question about it. Uh, the president last night indicated in a pretty pretty soft but I think direct way that uh, as far as we were concerned that uh, free trade was very much up on the table. Uh, therefore based on what we know today uh, we have no changes to make as an institution. I mean we think it's good for, for, for where we are obviously and are supporting it. Thank you. Go ahead please. I want to express the opinion that this Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation represents a cruel hoax for most Canadians. And the reason for that is that the total value of the money that they have to pay off this insurance represents only 3% of the total deposits. Canadian banks are amongst the shakiest financial institutions in the world, and that's because they're the most highly leveraged, much more highly leveraged than in the States. Jack, do you realize that if only one in ten depositors of Mr. Kaiser's bank walked in and asked for his money back, his bank would collapse in a cloud of dust, which it richly deserves to do. And I would recommend to your listeners that anybody who's got money in, a, in, in Mr. Kaiser's bank, get it out while you can. There's no reason to leave more than $1,000 ever in a bank account. Well, that's kind of brutal. I can't uh, let that pass unchallenged. Um, I don't know where you got your statistics that 3%, uh, the fund only covers 3% of the total deposits. Do you have any knowledge of that? Well, I, I think uh, the, the issue is correct. In other words, that if you take the whole system, we're only, we're only guaranteeing as a nation up to $60,000 of the depositor's money. But the, I guess the question I have with, with, with what you raise you say that... Uh, Only for the, the first few depositors. The first uh, few hundred depositors will get their money back, then all the money runs out. Okay. Well, let me just stay with you for a minute. You know, well, let's, let's just pursue it for a second. What you said was that, uh, that the American banks were lower leveraged than the Canadian banks and that all the Canadian banks were in shaky condition. I guess there are two points that you, that you ought to be aware of, and it may not change your decision, but there are two facts that you ought to be aware of. One is that the number of bank and trust company failures in the United States has been far greater than it has in our country. The second is that in the case of our own institution, the Bank of British Columbia, we are lower levered, we are lower leveraged than all of the American banks of over two billion or more in size. We are the most conservative. Now your point may be well taken that we're not conservative enough ourselves. And yet by industry standards, for example, in this country, we're two and a half times lower levered than any of the big five banks. But this guy doesn't like you in the first place. People that have got their money in your bank are playing with fire, and they're uh, very uh, much at risk. Thank you very much. So what do you actually say to a person who's totally down on particularly your bank? Well, the, the problem that he, he poses for all of us is that he wants the system to stop working. Uh, if you're talking in the case of our institution, we are the most conservative. He says, draw it out. Where are you going to put it? Uh, that's safer. You have to keep it in the, your money in the financial system or the whole nation stops. Earlier we were saying we're worried about jobs and getting people back to work. 
The only way they're going to do that is if we put money to work. If I come into you today, which I won't do, but if I come into you with a, neck, a, a building proposition today or a retailing proposition, what are the odds I'm going to get help from you? I mean, I'm a sound businessman. I'm going to do this, that, and such and so. I may start a little. I may get some money from the FDB or whatnot. Do I get any encouragement from you to go into business? Yes. I mean, we have to make the assumption that you're a sound businessman. Right, but right. if we can make that assumption, sure. Of course you can. So you don't think the future's all black? No, I don't think so. And, and the facts are the demand is up. One short question. Go ahead, please. Mr. Kaiser. Yes, yep. sir. Um, I'm a, a new customer of your bank. Um, I've lived in BC all my life, and I am extremely pleased with the service that I received from the Bank of BC. I'm 60 years old. I've been to the other banks through the years, and uh, in the last uh, year, I've gone to the Bank of BC, and you people are doing a very, very good job. Boy, you just made my whole day. Thank I you. I really am pleased with you. Thank you very much. They branch, and they are extremely cooperative in every way. Which branch? Burnaby Branch and uh, Okay, give me a lot. But they're very, very good. Thank you very much. Great, we shall thanks. watch which, with interest what Mr. Kaiser tells the banking committee in, in Ottawa next week. Thank you, Edgar Kaiser. I'll be back after the break. Don't forget, tomorrow morning, very special guest whom I interviewed in Toronto at the weekend, some woman by the name of McLean. Here's a little bit of the exchange we had together. <laughs> but there was a guy in this book to whom I took an intense dislike. My lover. Vassy. Of course, you would. Well, why would I? Well, because you want to be my lover. So anyone who got there first, you would have a disposition against No, no, no. More people. than that. More a kind of father figure. I thought, what a way to treat a woman like Shirley MacLaine or any other woman. See, I didn't... He was a male chauvinist pig oh, underneath no it all. Oh, no doubt about it. But all Russians seem to be. And that's what I was saying. He, he and I had an analogous relationship. What's an analogous relationship? Similar. Symbolic, mm. as between Russia and America. Here I'm this typically American woman involved with this typically Russian man. <laughs> and it was like that. And he treated you like dirt, and finally you got rid of him. Well, I treated him pretty crappy, too, Jack. Well, oh, your mean, language in the book was just appalling. Yeah. I would never use it except off camera. Of course. You're a hypocrite, you know, being what you are. <laughs> Don't miss Shelley McLean. Uh, what's the name of the book? Dancing in the Light, tomorrow at 9 a.m. precisely. It's Shirley McLean with Webster, tomorrow at 9 a.m. precisely. Meet the real Shirley McLean tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. When you meet Shirley McLean, you're inclined to think she's a weirdo right off the wall, but she's wonderful, as you'll see tomorrow morning with Webster at 9 a.m. precisely. 